again and happy new year to all of us. This is our very last semester, uh, our very last term week, I should say. Hey. <laughs> A lot of prophecies for you now. Okay. So this is our last week of the first semester. And we are here to do a quick mop up, a mopping up, and then preparing ourselves for the exam. I'm taking queries if there are any substantive content is already dealt with. So if anyone has any questions, I'm glad to take it. But currently we are on our Sakai page for Phil 417, Contemporary Issues in Philosophy. I want to know if you have any questions, please. As I walk you through the course outline as our way of mopping up. Let me ask first and foremost if anyone has any queries on the course outline. So this is it. We set off to engage as a team of faculty. Ably supported by our team was a little in this but we got good replacements over the period. So we had our this is the course description. Those are the goals we went through that. So I'm going all the way to our uh, final exam, as I'm projecting now, was 70%. The presentations in class, individual ones, whatever, will, will work together to give us a 15%. And then the research paper, which I'm through with grading, but I think that I want to review it again and select one or two. I mean, prune it a bit and then release the result. That's also 15%. So 15, 15, final exam, 70 are clear on that. Let me see if there's any question on that. Okay. I don't see a hand up yet. And then there's a strict statement on plagiarism that I think so far, generally, people have adhered to. Uh, so it's not as rampant as the past we would have seen it. You know your grading skill at level 400. So quickly to the substantive content which we dealt with already. What did we do? We looked at development first, focusing more on introducing the concept from a philosophical point of view, not from a cons or political science or sociology or whatever, because somehow are working at developing or they are working with the concept of development, but we were more focused on the philosophy of it, the, 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 uh, the grounding of, or the conceptualization of the term development. Okay, and then we moved on to some, some versions, some under, understandings that have been given to the concept. That's what we, we use our first two weeks to do. We looked at preliminary remarks. Do you any? Oh dear. Preliminary remarks on the concepts, and then we went to our course outline. And then now we went, we looked at Hultaban. Look on your screen, please. And Amartya Sen, mainly, but also augmented their readings with other thinkers on how we should understand development. And I'm not going to do another lecture, but you know, there was a talk of, it's a gradual process. It should be holistic. We were interested in its qualitative, you know, even though we, we, don't, we didn't want to overlook the quantitative, the measurable, you know, features, labels, outcomes, perspectives that go into development. But it had to be a holistic thing, not, not narrow thing. It should be uh, comprehensive, and so we saw all those. Your task will be to mop up nicely if you don't record them. That is on the concept itself. Then we looked, we did some historical overview of how the term development has transitioned. Remember, it was in understanding the conceptualization of the term development that we critiqued the notions of developed, developing, and underdeveloped, and what have you felt that, that some of the as a philosopher, a thinker, you can critique those. And Sana Keita helps us do that. I think Kwame Jachis own, our own Kwame Jachis paper also helps us see that. Do we ever finish developing for you to warrant the term developed? Okay. Is there some intonation of, uh, what was the expression? Um, politics. Is there some politics? Is the term politicized in the way, quote unquote? We, we are supposed to unravel that query and open out and critique and examine and evaluate even how the term is conceptualized. Now, the second part of the, the that team looked at how uh, development has emerged 
and conceptualization of the term privilege, with specific focus on Africa as a continent. So these authors were there to guide our thinking. And you can see that in the uh, resources and the and the slides and our in class discussion. We, we both campuses had some fine presentations on those that you can always refer to if you want. I end my introduction. Hey, excuse me, my mop up on development. If anyone has a question, let us take it now very quickly, please. Okay, I think we are good. I just hope you can hear me. Uh, Priscilla is around. I see CC and Sam, Vicious, Adiza. Uh, hey, Rebana, I don't know this name. Maybe I know the face. Okay. And I see Jifa, I see Matthew, Melky. Melky said that he didn't add the rest of your name. Can you can you all hear me, please? I I, I really need to make sure I'm audible again. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Extremely disciplined though. Is it a chicken that you should or something? <laughs> you have very calm. Or or is exam pressure? Don't worry at all. I don't bite. Very you know I don't bite. So you will do fine. Okay, so th uh, that was a quick uh, mop up of what we did on uh, for lecture one or for team one for the weeks that we dedicated to that. Then we moved on to the second thing, which I'm sure you are also well vexed in on the concept of decolonization. Remember the concept of development, the term and the, the, the categorization, the thinking around development comes across as heavily colonized. At least that was uh, seen in some of the texts we referenced and engaged in. Why would we call some nations developed and others underdeveloped and others supposedly undeveloped? And if we remember Hegel's text that we referenced, the very earlier text we looked at, it even thought that some had not even started developing at all, that because, because they, they haven't even started their history or their I mean, that sounds like, <laughs> uh, how do I even say it? I want, to be, I want to leave the discussion very open so that students can take their own position, but some of them, you can't help it. It looks extremely colonized, the way the conceptualization is that each nation is not developing. Everybody is developing. It's a present continuous. No one finishes doing that. But some way, somehow, it's, it's accepted and it is used and it has implications on how you are engaging in academically. Where did you publish your, your papers that you are uh, submitting for promotion? If it is just around some, put it, some parts of the world, then it looks like, oh, it doesn't matter. Where are we taking that, uh, the, the, the persons to this particular one is meant for so and so place and that particular one is meant for so and so place. And oftentimes the concern is not because of the you know climatic differences or climate change, uh, climate variation, but the seen, let me speak that way, to be a certain understanding, a certain perception that oh, as for so and so place, they are underdeveloped, they, they don't even have the IQ that we have. It. And that thing is what I think. Uh, uh, influences to a large extent the, the discussions in the second team or uh, uh, our course this semester, contemporary issues, the contemporary matter, contemporary and the massive contemporary issues must be that we looked at. So the second team of topics looked at decolonizing, mm -hmm. decolonizing. So the thing has been colonized, negate, D means take it off deactivate, denounce, see, so decolonize, but the author, Pesir uh, Edu, that we did that, says the decolonization should be addressing our concepts, we, 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 we decolonize the concepts. It's not so much, uh, you know, how we dress and what we eat, what, all those will happen if the thinking around the dress where the food we eat, the religion we participate in, the kind of educational system we run, what we consider to be a well, you know, organized <coughs> political uh, context. All those will be inspired, says really, by 
how we are thinking. So it is a conceptual concept idea, you know? conceptual decolonization. If we take off the colonial, the colony mentality of our politics, our language, the third one was what grab. <laughs> it's language, politics, and where are now fit the, the, the religions. These are very central language. So we, uh, we will not do the lecture again. Language is an embodiment of how we communicate to each other. So you may be saying something that is also said. I'm saying something. So let's use the example that Prophet Jay likes to use. I remember love. What well, if I say that I love you in English and meto? I, I jokingly told you in class, and I can't repeat them directly here, but imagine you want to say that those, the gentleman and the lady are making out in the car over there. See how I said it? You can easily say it without uh, you know, the feeling of the uneasiness or nerviness. Around. If you say it in English, say the same thing in typical country or tree or gun. They are all languages. <laughs> say directly that the guy and the lady are making love in the car. Say that in tree on air. Let us see if you can say it. Meanwhile, in English, it's easily said. Why? Just a sign to show us what we do is trying to predict. Language is an embodiment of a worldview, a reality. The way that people see the world is in the language. That is why if you go, where it says, don't be saying things, well, that's in a literal way, don't be saying things that you hear people say, democracy, they say it's a try like that. When the, the person who coined the word democracy is speaking, now translate it into your own language. Some say, kibi, mami, kibi. Say some, make I say some. You say and let me also say some. How can that be democracy? I bear for if you did. Computer, then that, that's a can now that I'm speaking. I bear for if you did. I bear for if you did, it also. <laughs> a modern machine, there are many. So it is difficult to capture the exactness of what the language is communicating. If you do it in another language, literally, and not just literally, he goes beyond just the literal English tree, but what the language connotes, what it stands for. So then he goes into the philosophy of it and shows us how the notion of existence and uh, life after death and some other things won't even make sense my own. to say that the thing exists. Somebody has gone out and it is not helpful. When I meet you, please keep it in your chat, okay? I know it's not intentional, but just be minded so that you don't disturb all of us. I was just helping you remember some of the things in read because it will come for your exam. I can be certain about that, okay? I'm, I'm just saying, so when you say it exists, the closest, as read, the closest rendition you can have in a can language. If you said it like a woho, the thing exists means it is there. But in the tree language, it is there in the tree language means a woho. It can't be there without having a location, a, lo, how do you say, a place that it exists at or in or on. Therefore, existence will not make sense outside of a world in which things existed. If we were speaking tree or a can. Maybe use uses that to show is therefore that I think therefore I am won't make sense in the key language. Yeah, I can language. I think therefore I am Descartes famous cogito ego sum. I think therefore I am. I am what would be the obvious question if you were saying the same thing in a can language. May gain into me war. You can't say me gain into me war. It won't make sense. To mean that that therefore you have made a claim of existence and therefore there's a whole problem of reality created which will engage epistemology in Western thought. He said that won't even arise in a can thought as well. So, and that is the man doing the philosophy of it, the typical philosophy of it. Now you can bring in your as the examples I give you. So when you say uh, uh, free will and life after death and some of the so-called metaphysically interesting, which also leads to epistemologically interesting questions. He says they don't even arise at all. Okay. Why would he go through all that? He did that philosophy to show and in the same way, when you come talking democracy, practice the practice will struggle because the conceptualization 
captures things that the language of the people in question cannot grab, not cannot as an inability to, but it is not in the language for you to see the problem, to solve it. So he, he says, therefore, our political, our politics, our religion, and then the language, these three put together, especially the language, if decolonized, that is take it out of the context of the colonizer. When the colonizer is speaking and says, free will, rights, what have you, it makes sense in their thought framework. It might not be exactly the same in how the language of the people in question. So he says, I'm speaking from an Akan background. So I'm using that, but it's the same if you were Zulu or you were Dutch or you were what you. You cannot import wholesale the literal language and the, the connotation, what the language stands for, the connotation of that language into another and think they will mean the same because you are using the same word. The word may be the same, what it means will not be the same. And therefore, using it for practice or so far. And so he thinks that is one of the problems for our difficulty in practicing what has been called democracy for us. We are struggling because we don't understand ballot box, multi-party kind of thing. What is partyism? That we are majority and these are minorities. Hey, does it, the people can't conceptualize that. Because that, is, that thing doesn't work. Hey, yeah, dear, we, the people, we own the government. Consensual approach to doing things. That's how we think. That's our thought framework. So you don't bring a ballot box and say we are counting how many people put a paper into that box. It will, it will be difficult to practice. So he pleads in another paper, he does a plea for what? A non-party political. That doesn't mean you can't disagree, but the few of us can say, oh, for this one day, we think that we should rather do it in, in year 2020, 2010. <laughs> That's 2025 or something. Let's do this other one for now. We can disagree, but so that time, these people will belong together as a party of thought. But the last moment, they wish upon again and make a decision for not one that has an entrenched party stick. So he puts that in there. It is not in the people's conceptualization. He references that kind of thought and uses that to argue in those. The same with our religions and our faiths and what have you, uh, life after death and all these are the things. If you put it in context, we may not confront some of the matters that we think are philosophically difficult to unravel and so on. But I spent some good time on the conceptual decolonization for your own sakes. I think that you'll recall. As for uh, Anido Ho's article, the metaphorical stuff, I think it's straightforward for you. Symbolisms that can help in carving an identity, an identity that is not fixated on the past, neither is it overly embracing of the future without critical evaluation, critical analysis. So the Sankofa symbol tells you that. He picks on the drum, the talking drum, how we are communicate. Communication mm -hmm. is there. And all the others. Kukwana as a figure of deception and yet also as a figure of one that will use all the ingenuity available to him to make sure he's fulfilling, for example, his fatherly rule or his friendship rule and so on and so forth. Key, iconic, metaphorical stuff that helps in carving an identity even as we decolonize, uh, take off that, the ones that we don't. So he, he thinks we should use symbolism. Our plays, our write-ups, our literature should capture those as a sign of creating an identity. Those, that was the second theme of contemporary issues that we discussed. Any questions, please? OK, still on the mop-up. Let me see the third one. Oh, dear. The third one is was for, for weeks five to six. A bit extensive, but we tried to uh, merge it and then keep our focus so that we don't get all over the place and, and lose out. God and morality should science. That was the main thing. The God factor is religion. And God is central to the concept of religion. So religion, morality, science. We, we did, I think first and foremost, we looked at the fact that God versus science discussion. And you did some prior presentations on those as well. I was very impressed by them, I think. Now, the argument 
for the existence of God is since they haven't do the whole thing. Okay? The various arguments. Can I have any of them? Let me see if people are still with me. What are some of their choral senses are fine? Don't worry, we'll meet up afterwards. Some of the arguments for the existence of label them. Which argument, which argument, which argument? Just a mute and answer. Okay, I can start. The ontological argument for the existence of God is one of them. Is there any other argument made for the existence of God? A moral argument. Very good. There is a moral argument. I'm sure Kant will come up there. Which other yeah. one? Thank you. Teleological. Well done. Teleological. Tell us. The cosmological, yes. cosmological argument. Cosmological argument. Very good. For uh -huh. The argument about the cosmos. Cosmos is an organization that then is planned. If it is this plan, there has to be a designer behind it. The telos is also like that. Purpose, there's purpose. Okay, well done. So those were arguments, and they are supposed to be philosophical arguments. They are not church arguments, per se. So the thinker looks at the world as organized. There's a plan behind it. Looks at the world as not just organized and uh, you know intricate and complex, but seems to have a plan. There's a design, telos. I didn't mean now when you say it. So, like the examples I gave you, everything has its purpose, its reason. A human being emits carbon dioxide and takes in oxygen. The tree takes in that carbon dioxide and brings out oxygen. So it looks like it's a plan, so that the thing never goes with. There's day and night a cycle. See the sea, the ocean boils consistently. Human beings give birth to their young. Another human being bears lay eggs. Chicks, you know, so all plant. Some some uh, keep their babies for nine months. Others, 21 days, the eggs are, are, are hatched, sorry, and, and stuff like that. Mosquitoes, oh, that they have a lifespan. Human beings have a lifespan. The point is, even if it varies, it varies within a certain group. Human beings don't fly physically, raising their hand. I don't know about which, which is which is room and what those ones we can speak to. But the whole point is an organizing this design intricately done. This is an argument from a thinker, philosopher, who we went through all those. So that it is not a straightforward matter to rubbish what we call faith or religion or God. It is not straightforward like that. It's difficult to do so because there has to be a brain or an ultimate mind behind the orderliness that you see. That's one argument. The other one says, if there's a commander, human beings don't behave like animals. They have claimed that they share in common, but others are not. There seems to be a, a, a duty of morality placed on us. And if there is that, there must be a commander. Something must be making us. These are all inductive arguments. Some are did that. We saw them. We saw them. So you have mentioned all. Then the problem of evil comes up. If there is such an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-benevolent God, that is a being that is ensuring that he is the epitome of all of that, at least from Descartes' argument, which we saw in nationalism in levels 100 and 200 as well. Then we should be able to know that that being who embodies all this, is the contrast, is the opposite of our imperfections, our inability to know all things. This one will make sense only if there is an ultimate or powerful being who knows all things. That is the only time it will make sense to say, I don't know. If I'm imperfect, then I must be perfect by deduction. Otherwise, the imperfect doesn't make sense. Imperfect is a negation of perfection. So the imperfect me or imperfect I, they can suggest perfect entity. God. Okay, so by that kind of reasoning and some more, of course, there's secularity until the end. We come to some argument of an, a being that knows all things, is able to do all things, omnipotent, can be everywhere at once, omnipresent, as well as well. Now, the, the question is how can such a being be, and yet there is evil in the world? Evil negates the omnipotence, all-knowing, or what at one of them at least, of this all-encompassing being. We try to do a philosophical analysis of it. I think one of the strong arguments I believe I, I, I push when I discuss this is 
it is not really if you are even just a thinker, don't go to church, don't put Bible, don't say, Oh, he knows why you are going through the evil. Who calls what you are calling evil evil? Who? You and I. We don't know all things. If you don't know all things, then who tells you, you and I, human beings, that our definition of evil necessarily equates to what evil is or what evil must be? Why won't you then let the, the being that you are calling all knowing be the one defining what evil is? If you say he's all knowing or she's all knowing, whatever label you want to give that ultimate being, if you say he or she's all knowing and all powerful and all this, then let him decide what evil is before you go and use your definition of evil to tell him that why have you allowed evil to maybe what you call evil is good by the one who knows all things like the way giving medicine to a child for the child it looks like mommy is wicked oh, why, why is mommy making me you know grind the pepper when we could have used the then or something why is mommy making me learn she's so wicked on me maybe that is what it is that we are calling it. Do we know all things? No. That is it. That, I mean, that's as simple. I don't need to do church, Bible, anything. If you admit that, because this is what I say you admit, we are using that as an argument. So it becomes your premises you are using to, to, to state the problem of evil. That the being is all knowing, all benevolent is all good, all powerful, can stop all things and can do all things, and so on and so forth. And yet there's him. Then by your own premises, he has all these qualities. Let him be the one deciding evil. Don't go and tell him that there is evil because you see something as evil. What if it is not? If it is not evil, then there is no tension for you to use that to make it philosophically. And I think that that was very strong. Apart from the others, that the religious folks like you and I, strongly religious, I believe. And yet my philosophical <laughs> Mindset can still query those. Don't tell me that uh, he wants you to go to the evil so that no, 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 you can't tell me to go to evil if he's all good. But you can tell me that what I'm calling evil may not be evil for him. The son. So the, those of you who share Christian faith, and I use a lot of that in class because you see questions on this as well. I don't know how I ask it. You know, the son of the father was on the cross being nailed for something he didn't do. Hasn't done. He's calling the father, the father has ignored him. Why? Because it was good. It is not evil for the father. The father doesn't see that as an evil for him to come and correct. He was drinking his own. Like I jokingly said in class. That could possibly be what is happening when we see earthquakes, a child that was born just today, born, excuse me, or excuse me, my special student who may be playing this little in here. And you're born visually blind or something, you say, Oh, how can God allow such evil to happen? Who defined that as evil? You and I. What if it is not evil? Oh, but why is it not evil? Because you're not all knowing. You call someone all knowing. Let him decide what evil is and what is. And there's no problem after all. So that is what we are pushing. You may think to it, and if you have a counter response or anything. I'm not saying that is the answer fully, but it is something to help you think through what has been labeled as the problem of evil, which, for instance, is used by some to denounce the existence of God. I mean, an arrogant, you know, posturing. <laughs> Say that then you have doubts about it. Say, That's fine. But don't use something because I don't know it, therefore it is not there. That's arrogant. I don't know him to be a thief, therefore he's not a thief. Are you God? Are you... Do you know everything at once? So the fact that I don't know something doesn't make it uh, true or false in itself. Philosophically speaking, as a thinker, before we even go to our faith or our beliefs or our assumptions, let's deal with the matter. So I don't know who killed uh, the MP, whose death we are still investigating. Therefore, it means what? It is not the, the person we are pointing to. Why? It could be the person. But it could also not be the person. So this, the humble posturing of people who have concerns, Gnostics, will be to say, look, we don't have good, I don't have good grounds to say. But don't say God does not exist because of your inadequacy. That's also another critique. And neither should the one who also, you know, obviously that God exists because you don't have answers to this. Why? Why should you impose that on someone? 
Where is where is the evidence? What brush did he use to brush his teeth? And so on. You can't give the person that 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 one. The person must leap with faith. So either way, the best posture is the one that humbly admits my inadequacy to know, not to denounce the existence of God or faith or religion, make it rubbish because you in your small self cannot grab an all-knowing, all-powerful, or so and so and so. That's the problem of evil that we tried. I think there was also a concern with one of the arguments that was built on cause and effect causality. Everything that we see, the cosmological one, the whole cosmos in the world we see must have been caused by something. Why? Because everything that exists must have been caused by something. So if there's a physical world with everything in it like this that we can't deny, we are talking to each other, then there must be a cause for it. And you say the cause is God. Then we all say, okay, that's beautiful. But what then caused God, who is now an effect? Then you are angry that we are asking you that. People of faith, <laughs> why are you angry? So God must be the ultimate cause, the final cause. Why did you see say the final cause is the world? Nothing is beyond that one. You see, that's also a challenge for the people of faith to deal with like myself. And when you come to me, I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> anyway, so that those were the discussions when it, we did, dealt with God and science. Then we gave a little, not much, but a little attention because we dealt with some morality when we saw Kant. So we saw the morality, moral factor, but I don't plan to ask you question on morality and God. We did moral philosophy. So it shouldn't be our concern much. If we do God and science, it's fine. Remember the, the cheap paper we looked at and the altars he referenced when we're looking at. The, I don't want to give you all the answers, I, the, the pointers, but remember the four ways of thinking about the, the relationship between religion and science. That's God and science or religion and science. Let me see if people remember. I want answers, labels that describe the relationship that exists between religion and science. I want chorus answers again, just to be sure everyone is here. Very quick, 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 quick. quick. I can give you one dialogue. So give me the other two. The conflict view. Very good. Conflict view. Independence view. Very good. Independence view. Very good. And the last one. The integration view. Excellent. Well done. Hey, hey, you flow power. Plenty easy. Eh? Okay, so now we can move on to the, the last but one thing. Uh, you would see then that from, from our God or religion and science, then we moved on to environment. The environment discussion was too full. Let me see. I think I made a uh, migration of food. Okay, so the environment team mainly, can someone do the mop-up? I really don't want us to do another lecture, but it's just to make sure that some key things are clear in people's minds. Is anybody willing to do that? Let me see if there's a hand up. Anyone summarize something for us on the environment team? Very quickly. Okay, people don't, at around these times, so I know that people don't like talking plenty, but they are keeping it for the exam. They have been given a country not to talk too much so that the information will remain. So let, let me see if I can do that. So introduction to theories in environmental philosophy. One key thing that you can't forget is an anthropocentric view of environment versus the others. That's all. This, this is key. Then we also know that some would, would think non-anthropocentric and yet they still make room for respecting, valuing, nature or other parts of the environment and versions of it. So you see ecofeminism, you will answer a question on that. I hope I remember all the ones I've told you. You will have to. Ecofeminism is there. There were other versions of non anthropocentrism They don't want you to be centered on the human person and his or her benefits only so that every other thing has value but only instrumentally valuable. That for climate folks, for gendered discussions and what have you, is not proper. Now you will see the argument, but not everybody has said that we shouldn't 
eat or we shouldn't cut down some trees, you know, to get ourselves tables and chairs, furniture, or we shouldn't make way in the ocean or something like that. No, no one perhaps has argued that way. Even the vegetarian would still lie on a, a, a bed or wear clothing. Clothing is cotton or something that you got from a tree. So by all means, you would offend nature somehow, which is cool. But I think the concern, and it was very central in our discussion, is the abuse, the hurt, the suffering. And so remember the, the one having to do with agency and patience. I'll ask you questions on that. You say, well, human beings are agent, moral agents. Well, thank God that your moral agent says not some aspect of the non anthropocentric Others who are patient, moral patient, they are the receiving end. You have to respect that and feel for them because they suffer. They are sentient beings like you and I. So you argue around that. If it is for food and some clothing, you know, to eat according to his or her need, that's fine. But where you you just know that you are in charge, so some superiority and, uh, you know, no regard for their needs. It's going to the recording, the noise. Little one is playing a game here. Okay, so so those ones, the authors, or uh, those who are going for non anthropocentrism are not correct. Cases, okay, so go through your slides, and then if you still think you should mop up some other things, then you do. We didn't do too much of the climate change. It's all over the place, you know, politics, you know, environment, the, the, the natural scientists are on it, the physical scientists are on it. So that's my last one. If you do take this off. Then the, our last thing was on migration. You see that the, the weeks 11 and 12 one on the moral status of non-human animals. This one, we discussed it in as part of our discussion on the, uh, on the, on the environment when we dealt with animal welfare and the other one. So that one was already dealt with. I'm talking about the moral status of non-human animals. Some don't think they are moral status. That's where the sentience and the agency, and the patience come in. So we have dealt with that. But now the final one on migration. Before we do that, I want to still find out if someone has a question or a concern. Okay, so that's also Okay, so we will talk quickly about the migration. The migration one, what are some of the things we should remember there? Immigration and emigration concern. The binary discussion has always been on whether we should allow them or we should not allow them. The author, the last presentation, beautiful, beautiful presentation for both campuses. Even the one done online with City Campus was excellently done as well. The concern is, should it be coming or don't come in? This two-way kind of discussing the issue is not a fair way to do it. It says our, our uh, the author that some of you focused on, we shared the topic. So he thinks that no, you should you should put some variations on it. For what purpose? Is it health? Is there an emergency? Is the person running away from uh, uh, war? Are we bringing in a terrorist? What is the rationale? Is there a health outbreak? Uh, uh, disease outbreak that warrants a humane attitude. So the degree of restriction matters. It's not so much should they be allowed in or should they be prevented from coming. That's too straight jacketed a way of discussing the question of migration. Says this author that I want you to go and answer a question on him as well. Okay. What else? We said that uh, uh, there are several ways of thinking of migration. You may think of it as neighborhood. You may think of it as a club. Sometimes you think of it as a family. Which one works well and why? I leave it there. Your, your task is to, the slides are there, our discussions are there, recorded online sessions, class interactions, your police presentations, your own uh, submissions and the feedbacks you receive from those. Read around it, you will answer. Things on that. Any questions on that? Demo. So I'll quickly go to your assignments. 
page and then we will be clear on where we have reached if you have any questions then you ask if not end the session so am i actually assigned that we didn't do any tests and quizzes so we have but all we're on assessment so there so you will see that how do i do it without rejecting someone's name Okay, so we I opened a makeup for those who wanted it to do it. There's a makeup group presentation. The key things there is a paper is there, 15%. Submission on religion and science, we did that class presentation one. And then the others we did in class, I can put on my own paper. They are all there. I will use the research paper over 15 the class presentations, like your course outline showed you over 15. I augment the class presentations with all the other ones that we did. And then your exam essays will look at how you fared in the exam. And if there is a need to push it up, for sometimes the two and a half hours or two hours, I think for you, we'll do two and a half hours. Doesn't help the student. Sometimes I say, don't go and rely on, or even if I don't do well, the, the dog can augment it. No, no, no. It can't be. Certificate, go to the exam center poised to take a 70 percent, you know, mark in the exam. So, as I said, I'm thinking of three essays. Initially, I, I contemplated a compulsory one, it's still not settled, I doubt, just so that people can be allowed the, the freedom to move around the five topics that questions will be asked on, and then they choose any three. That will mean that we we'll for 70, we may have uh, uh, 25, 25, 20. That's 50%. Uh, so, excuse me, 70%. So 25, 25, and then a 20. 25, 2 will be 50, then 20 will be, or you add it to the 50, will be, to be 70. So possibly there will be sections. One section having three questions, each with 25 marks. The other section having two questions, each with uh, 20 marks. So you pick two from the 25 section and then one from the 20 section. So five questions, you see there. But the first three, which are with 25, you pick two from the 50. And the second two, which are with 20 marks, you pick one from there. So that 50 from the first section, 20 from the second section, give you 70. That you are looking for, but the topics will be five, which means it won't be on everything you've done. But if you have spread your, your tentacles wide enough, then you should be able to answer the questions. The nature of our questions, as usual, they won't be recalled. This is philosophy. We don't ask you to tell us, give an account of something. We will ask you to critically review, discuss critically and offer a contribution or, you know, do a comparative analysis. I, I doubt if I, even if I ask that, but if I ask that, that would be the introductory, but comparative analysis and respond to something so that you will be able to suggest options for doing, uh, for dealing with that question. Okay. So that, that those are the things you'll be asking. Analyze. If you asked me, I don't like restricting people, but sometimes the more the person writes, the, the chances are that they will be saying things that are not relevant because you are working within a time frame. But I cannot say that as a general rule for everyone because some to write so much, they are able to coherently and still within the time work that way. Whichever way you go around it, this is level 400. You cannot do, I didn't did it, it didn't went You're all over the place. When you set up to answer your questions, answer the question. In other words, deal with the question you have been asked. Don't go beating about the bush. I wish I could find one or two of my past questions on this course. Then we share it. Let me see. Let me see very quickly. If you have any question, you may raise your hand now as I, I look to my desktop. This is a course outline. I want a question paper. Oh, I see. Oh. 
There is one plan there. Okay, this is the 2021 one. Let me see if I can share that. Yes, for us to use because it's not likely we will repeat. We don't repeat exam questions for the sake of ensuring quality, but at least you can have a fair idea of the kinds of questions we are. So it is open. While that's while that open, let me take questions that you may have if you still have any. I pause for your questions so you have any please. I'm done. So you have your exam, nature of exam questions, essays, three essays, likely two and a half hours. I don't think three hours seated at one place is fair. And if you give three hours, students will sit for three hours. Even if they use only one hour, they will still be, I don't understand. And if you give three hours and after one hour, students are done and they are going, it's no good for the examiner and the course. It's as if they really didn't know what they were about. So you give a fair time. Normally I would have asked two hours, but it's level 400. Someone may have canceled something. Else. So it needs another 30 minutes. Away. So 30 minutes on one person should be fair enough. And then 10 or so minutes each to mop up, check your tenses, rephrase, what have you, is fine. Two hours at most should have been okay. But 400 level. The depth of the question, maybe some sit down 30 minutes thinking through each of the questions, outlining their points. Fine. So, two and a half hours fair for 70 marks out of 100. Within that period, <laughs> to make up for all the 13 and 12 weeks of learning, I think it's fair. On five topics, five. So that when I say five topics, you know that even within one topic, that one, one of the teams, we could have three or four topics. Just look at the environment one, it's more than enough. Or look at uh, the God and religion one. There's the argument for the existence of God there. There's a the problem of evil there. There is a relationship between religion and science there. These are all different topics within the team. Okay, so I'm saying on five topics. So you cannot punch and come and punch. Okay, my word is ready now so I can project it for you to have a feel of some questions I asked in the class, and then we are done. Since you don't have any questions. Yeah, so this this is, I think this was 2021. Yeah. 417. The students had, uh -huh. this was for 40 marks. Is this mine? Let me see who set it. Oh no, this is Dr. Morgan's one. I want mine. I'm coming. Just a minute here. Uh, how do I do this? Okay. Oh dear. If I don't get that one immediately, then we may just have to. We may just have to depend on what I, I just told you. And then we can work with that. Okay, okay, I think there's a PDF here. Let, let's try that one and see if it works fine. If it doesn't, then I did my best. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, meanwhile, just so that we don't create the vacuum, do you have any questions? This one says, critically analyze the concept of development. It was for two hours. So let's project that. Oh dear. Okay, please, like, can you see my screen now, please? It's a PDF, so I don't know if it projected. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it is um, 2022-2023. 
Can anybody see it? Yes, please. Okay, okay, that's fine. So this is what I put. This is my. I think I I sent this question. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's look at them. For example, one of you may want to read question one for me, please, quickly. It was for two hours before it was worth fifty marks. Read it for me. There was a compulsory question. Critically analyze the concepts of development, considering a matter sign. Michael Paul Tudaro and Utevan have seen various views on gradual process, qualitative change, and multi multidimensionality. Show from your analysis the extent to which you would agree or disagree with the categorization of nations as developed, underdeveloped, underdeveloped, and undeveloped. Or oh, undeveloped. Very good. So for such a question, there's a lot that you will write, a lot. But the question seeks that you critically analyze. You do an analysis, break the thing down, but do it in a critical way. Critical, meaning you look at the pros and the cons. You examine the thing, even as you break it and you explain it, as you open it out. You do so with a critical eye. You don't leave anything on the So the, the parts that are strengths, you highlight. The parts that are weaknesses, you highlight. Okay? Do that. On what? On how these authors have conceptualized develop, development. Specific authors, Amatia Sen is there, Michael Potodaro is there, and Wicha Van Hapton is there. Each one of them. Show how, they, not that you take one and do and take another. That's a style if you want to do that, but that would be too much work. However, you can talk about the concept development and how it has been you know, captured or explained or understood by Wicha Van, for example. And then you may use uh, Amatia says you to either support it or counter it or strengthen it or take from it. And in doing so, you say, and, and that is where, uh, what is the other guy? Uh, Wutavan comes in with his view that uh, development must be so and so and so and so and so. What if you are doing that? You are giving an account, but you are doing so in a critical way to show that the challenge we may have though, for example, if we just dealt with the qualitative without giving due recognition to the quantitative, as Uchavan, for example, says, or as Amatya Sen says, is that it will it will it will overlook so and so and so, which is also crucial. But you see what I'm doing? I'm critiquing using the authors in question for the first part of the question, emphasizing the the question says gradual process. So which one of them stresses? That development is a gradual process, not an at one stage. If you tip a porous here, if you at once try to brush it, you, you there will be blood. You don't do the thing at once. The child was born today, you know, chicken, uh, uh, you know, hatched today, and then you inject it to become a mother chicken so you can use it to do KFC. You give the people sickness. Let the thing go through its process. The people don't like process. A flatter no, the you know, as soon as the, the KK is in the process of being made, that platter is the first stage before you add the, the, the other one and mix and put them in the husk, KK husk, before you put it on fire. You there, that platter, no, multi -man, multi -man. bring it, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, you will be sick. The thing has to go through a process. So development must be gradually done. Gradual doesn't mean slow. Gradual means let it go through it. Imagine the woman gets pregnant today and then she's in a hurry to graduate for it. So the next day she wants to put the baby out. What will you get? Yeah, it has to go through nine months. Now you don't say, oh, it's gradual, gradual. So you to 30 years, you are still pregnant with one child, a human being. That one too is problematic. Africa, see that. So gradual process doesn't mean slow process. Now the emphasis there, the question asks for gradual. It talks of qualitative change. All change will be changed. Okay. The change must be the quality. So it, there's a, a, a an evaluation there. It's not just change as a change. Some changes might be retrogressive. You're going to, you are not going forward. You are going back. So change is not necessarily progress or development. And so one of the authors, and I don't want to give you all the answers. We have studied it. Says that yes, there might any time we talk development. There's growth. But the growth, if you had a growth on your time, 
our sisters to got a growth, God forbid, in your in your uh, bobby spanner, eh? <laughs> your breast. That is not that is not a growth that we are happy about. Mm? Mm. A growth somewhere is not proper growth. So it's not every growth that is qualitative. That's the point we are making. Sometimes what we have grown in is growth in insolence. And the moral fabric hurt. Society's mm. moral fabric has been hurt. We think we have grown. But growth, even the physical growth of the body, is what I have referenced. If your body is growing, it is a good sign. The child is growing, go to hospital, the way they are checking the child, so the, the weight has increased. Yes, sometimes the increase of weight is sickness, it's called obesity. So, qualitative change, progress, gradually done, not delayed in the name of gradual process, and not a rush because you want to develop. These are coming from these sources. And you can put it in the context of economics, politics, human. One of them talked human. There are people there, eh, eh, there are brothers. I mean, in class, I would have stressed, or you can play the past recordings to that we have there if you need it. But they will marry a woman, give her a home. The buildings, as she didn't see, building, TV, flat screen, eh? uh, cars, maids, what have you, but they themselves are never there. If you joke, the gate man will use your machine where, well, where, well, where, well, where well for you. This one, if you don't understand, don't worry. It's not essential to the exam. The gate man, with all his mailing and pitch, will use your machine because you just develop the material. This is coming from one of the authors. <laughs> yes, I didn't use my example. <laughs> my example is the one you remember. I believe. You see, you have you have developed quote and unquote aspect material. So she has houses, she has clothing, she has manicure and pedicure artists all over. Her gowns are many different bags, Brazilian hair, whatever you, whatever some ladies think are what are important. Well done, you've done that. But where are you? Because she has human needs, not even intimacy. She has to, she has a social need. A human need that must be met. She must talk to her husband or wife. Turn it the other way. You are not there. Oh, me don't quite need to feed you. The way I'm doing where are you? Then the house girl will lay the bed, set the table. You cook the food down well, but she will set the table and set the table. And when she finishes, she will set the table. That is the point. This one is coming from one of them, or even all of them, but one of them emphasizes multi-dimensionality, human development as key. So don't go and take somebody's daughter and say, she's my house girl I'm living with. I give her food, I clothe her, what I do. Do you relate to her as a human being? Or you think she's a thing? Everybody finishes eating before she eats. You are you are not growing a certain part, you are not developing a certain part of her, it will come and hunt you. Don't think you've done well, go and give the person food and clothes you. You are put there. If you deal with her as a human being, you meet a human needs, a material needs, educational needs, a hospital needs, whatever, all of them holistically. So development must be holistic. These three authors are speaking from different angles and then the question asks you to touch on that. Do it critically, showing the strength showing the weakness, showing what is what hasn't been emphasized here and filling in with the other person. Then the second half of the question says, show from your breakdown, your analysis, eh, your, your teaching. Analysis means you are teaching me what the person is saying. You are analyzed, are breaking it down and opening it out and showing its consequences and implications and what it doesn't say and what it says. And what that means and what it doesn't mean. That's analysis. And we want you to do it critically. It means don't do it in a, a myopic way. You are looking at one way, and you are a philosopher. So you see me, a person of faith, I believe, discussing the existence of God. Because I'm doing it from an objective point of view, and I'm doing it critically in a course called philosophy. Doesn't mean you, you don't have faith or something, you want to speak as if you were not the one. If someone else who doesn't share your faith, maybe he's not Christian, or even if he's Christian, doesn't share that kind of faith, was looking at that, will it, he or she see it the way you see it? So you have to put on the spectacles and look at it from all angles. That's critical analysis. There's a strength for that. Okay, so from your analysis, show the extent to which you will agree 
there comes your contribution to the discourse, without which you haven't done philosophy. Your contribution must not be a new thing that hasn't happened on earth before. There's nothing new under the sun, says the Bible, which is an authoritative text, garbage. BBA anyway, you see that. So you don't think they are coming to create a new thing that hasn't happened before. No, that's not what we are asking you to do. But it is your way of seeing the problem and how you want to agree. So you agree because of so and so. There must be a reason. That's what we are looking for. The reason may coincide with another person's own or may disagree with another's own, but it is your reason. And that is what you own in the discussion. So show why you agree or disagree with what. Not everything that has been said, look at the question. With how the concept development has been categorized, where we call some developed, others underdeveloped, others undeveloped, not that they are under, they haven't even developed at all. Why? They haven't moved. They, they, they are standing at one place. Show us the extent to which you agree or disagree. Maybe you agree that, no, please don't defend these people. They haven't done anything. Give us reasons. We are philosophers. Let's say. They haven't moved at all. They don't cook their food. They don't grow uh, their crops. Nothing. They, they, Africa or which part of the world hasn't done anything. Or they have done it, but it's too small. It's too small relative to what? Who is measuring? Because everybody is transition. Look at our politics. Even this, well, the people that you say are, are doing it differently now. Is everything they are doing better? Because you may be looking at politics, but development is holistic, multidimensional, qualitative, and the growth is gradual. So maybe you say, oh, when it comes to our, our uh, human relations and the way we think of the collective and what have you, perhaps Africa may have something to say, generally speaking. But when it comes to so and so and so, and you check it against this, that's how you argue. You don't put everything in the basket and say, you ask for this, but nothing good can come from Nazareth. Those are. So that was the heartbeat of this kind of a question. Question two said, is African philosophy a Sankofa project? Justify your answer. You know what that is, it's for 15 months. Is it a return to the past? For every Sankofa, yes or no? If we ask to do philosophy from an African, this was a, 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 a professor, my, my other colleague's question that I gave for that time. Then question three says, evaluate reduce argument for conceptual decolonization. Evaluate. Evaluation means judge that a value, place value. Every day I tell students, evaluate, judge, I don't market. So it means when you finish, you can leave it open and say this might be charge. And if you are judging, you see how the judges read their judgment? They, there's a one they come to proclaim also declare. But if you want the full judgment, it is detailed, they state it and tell you, he said this, and said that, and said that, and the law constitution about this, this, this says this, and that and that. And so because of that, it's, so you are judging means you you will open out the discussion. Then when you finish, you do an evaluation. So he says, evaluate where those arguments for conceptual decolonization in terms of its viability for contemporary African thought and practice. What is viability? How viable is it? Is it? Can we use it? Eh? It's functionality, if you like. For contemporary African thoughts and yaging this year and practice. Can you go back to your the wholesale past there? For where do says, look, let's stop talking and, and thinking in categories that are alien to us. But look at this lecture we have here. Do I teach in tree or Ghana or Fanti? <laughs> How do we do it? Look at Ghana. It is a nation created out of the colonialist whip. You don't choose to be Ghanaian. You are inside Ghana. Half of uh, some, some folks at uh, the Zimai area there, are Ghanaian and the other half, one ethnic group, the other half I am good one. By the colonialist whip. So you, what are you? I Ghanaian or I vote. You can't come and vote in Ghana if they put you in that. This is a product of something we can't undo easily like that without creating mayhem and havoc. Look at the West into Gulland when they say they are not Ghanaian. Look at what happened. So in contemporary Ghana now, the national language is English. How do we speak three or Ghana or Fant? 
in the past, they wouldn't whip you for speaking vernacular at school. I don't know whether when you were in school, they told them. You go to school and say, Mama, I'm missing me, but I'm in trouble. You're in trouble. Your own mother tongue. Have you gone to US and or US crying, okay, UK or Germany or somewhere and they are speaking your tree there? But your method of no at you at Germany. Then they will lash them for speaking German language in their German crew. We, oui, you would have been lashed for speaking Grushi or Frafra. Because I'm speaking vernacular. We have gone through that. I don't know about that. Just transition. But look at we have transitioned though. But still, the traces, we are talking about the viability, how viable. Look at now, look at the class we are holding now. But for French, 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 English, Latin, that we are speaking. It is part of the product of the contemporary. It's difficult, almost impossible to return to an indigenous way of speaking, indigenous way of doing. Are we going to do color to school? Do you know color? You wear your cloth around your neck and tie it that way. That that is how we live. How which class lecture will you enter with that kind of dress? So you may hey, hey guys, you may think that that is a uh, quote and unquote. I'm not saying that is what the past was. I'm just giving example that you can relate to. Are we going to do subsistence farming in the name of originality and authenticity? We do have an advocate for that, but it is not clear how. We decolonize our language, wholesale, our faith. Are you now going to denounce faith? Because both Islam and Christianity are not Ghanaian. Hello? Yes, they are not Ghanaian. They're not authentic to us. We, we inherited it or received it from either Europe or wherever. Friends, so how viable is the argument that Redu makes for a decolonization. We haven't said it is not useful or wise. So far, the critique I did emphasize the negativity. I'm talking about the other side. If you talked about the other side, will we continue wearing the extra large shoe that Sister Thank You people have given us? The thing doesn't fit our leg. When we walk one, two, four down, one, two, four down, and still you are wearing it. Redu says, go and remove it. And where the one that your leg can fit in, maybe a hand at the flat one or some foot that is good for your gravel society. And you stop wearing high heel that your brother be in the US brought you. Because when you are walking, this one doesn't work. Something like that's figurative. It's what he's doing. If you don't want that, he says it's not viable. What will you do? Will you continue practicing the democracy that is causing coups upon coups? At least it is one of the contributing factors. Eh? Coups upon coups in 2023, coup, Africa. Why? That's radio. So how viable it is need not necessarily be negative. But we may have difficulties that your write-up, your essay would want to emphasize and show that this is good because it will help us. This blah, 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 blah. We have all these challenges, but we still have to do this, this. So I judge it to be as evaluation. I judge it to be a viable option rather than the wholesale adoption. Or someone will say, what we have imbibed already, we can't do anything about. So going forward, we can't tell our children not to speak vernacular. We must work towards a national language, even if it is one of our native languages, languages that we adopt as a national one is better than taking the alien one whose categories are far-fetched. They are difficult to grab. Hmm? But I think that if we were, we were all speaking tree or gun or fancy, as a national, one of them as a national, it's easier to grab because they are close. We live together, generally. Eh? The conceptualization won't be too distant. Like the way someone raised their left hand and say, Trump, Trump addressing, say, the US president, then they say, Trump, this is, you can't say that before, too far. Where is that before? Uh, too far, I don't know. Or, or so I use his first name. Uh, give me, maybe a too far space. I don't know. I am just giving his Francis. They go and say that you forget that is, you are standing in front of them. Say, Francis, for example, say, with your left hand, we, we are dead. But it doesn't, it won't be a problem somewhere else where you are learning to speak that. People say, oh, where you go to this, even where you went to the telenovelas, they address themselves, their bosses with their first name. Go and live in the telenovela world and do that. This is Africa, Ghana. We don't do that. We don't do that. And it is not anything that will kill you address people by their offices. Nothing will go wrong. 
Eh? Because the people have created a world view, the way they view the world, that accommodates that. There's no snow in Ghana. Where is the snow? <laughs> so when you do those and that's really those habits. And so the back question wanted you to talk about that, not just the thought, the thinking, but also for practice. So you look at the pros and the cons and you respond, okay? Questions like these ones will be asked. The question four said, assess, assessment. When I do an assessment of you, you know what that means, assess. I wait, I shake it. Eh? I'm not just opening it out and looking at the implicate, but this one, I'm weighing it. I'm excited. It's, it's like critically examined. Okay. Assess, shake it. So assess my Wolves' argument for what? Restrictive international borders. Considering the libertarians and global egalitarians' argument for open borders. We know that Wolves are. At least if you've forgotten, you can do your quick review. I did a review with you. Mm -hmm. What was that thing is that there should be regulation. But the regulation may come in different versions. And he critiqued them, the neighborhood mentality of regulation, where people can come in and go as they like. <clears throat> the family one, and then the club one. Then afterwards, he made his case. You can read and look at it. Now, Libertarians and global egalitarians think otherwise. They think we must have, we must have open borders. And you remember, they make the argument. People should feel free. Those are, remember the first critique I, I, I read. Feel free. You feel free to free out there. You are entering people's rooms and their bedrooms because it's a free world. And determining, uh, opening their pillowcases sense. Ah, this is your pillow. You have put in too much and you have to change it. Is that how you feel free? And enter people's, so even if it's a terrorist, they're free, 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 free. Maybe that is what, not what the, uh, the open borders folks are arguing for. Then they have to clarify what they mean. Libertarians, global egalitarians, treat everybody equally globally. Who should prepare their nations for you to be enticing and uh, beautiful and you know, full of opportunities for you to come and express your equality label? You see how I'm speaking now? Yes, as if I'm all for closed borders. No, not necessarily. Because you too, when you advocate for closed borders, closed borders, closed borders, without any caveat, then there's fire in your home. We'll see where you go. Now you want to go where? When you have closed all borders, so people build their houses, they are gated, their first door has designer trapped doors because they don't want a thief to enter. It's so trap when you go to the gate trap, there's an electrical, uh, whatever the house, the whole house is electrocuted. Even the trees are all electrocuted. The, the pavement has you know, because they know that day they, they are okay. Someone that is entering until the day there's fire, go for it, or something is happening in there. Some hyper psychological issue affects the brother, he pulls a gun or a knife and he's after you. Go for it now. The door. How to on, on <laughs> how to open it? You open 30 keys before you open the bedroom one. Then the next one to 30. When you finish the front door, 100 before the gate, the electric electrical thing. Where would you get out? I'm speaking figuratively for you to see that it can't be the binary. The way people think is either we let them, you know, go. there has to be reasons and regulations, and the how stringent you are in your regulation is what matters. So the gentleman who's, and I, I'm forced to mention his name, Nayong, yeah? whose paper you did those fine presentations on. If you've forgotten, remember the groups that presented in class on the migration. And they will, they will become fresh in your mind, okay? Look at the argument, how stringent are we? Was it, is it a moral matter? That one will make you soften your rule is not coming or go binary, two way affair, in or out. No, it depends who is coming in and for what and for how long and with on what grounds. And also, who are you restricting and for what and how long? So, Michael was this thing. And then we ask you to look at the global egalitarian and those people's arguments. So, do an assessment, giving particular attention to that. Question five. These were so many. Eh? I won't do that for this one. This one, 
by all means, the person will get some 20 points. Mm -hmm. This one will give you just five. Three at the top, you pick any two. Two at the down, you pick any one. 50% chances. Do human animals have basic moral rights? I've dealt with that. Provide a critical response to this question with emphasis on the notions of direct and indirect welfareism. Speciesism. Speciesism, eh? That is a something you shouldn't do. You are just highlighting, like ethnocentrism, if you talk human being. Your group is superior and whatever than other groups. Speciesism has that kind of push to it. It thinks of its species as a human, if you like, species as having superior, you know, place over and above the others. Want you to touch on that? Want you to touch on direct and indirect welfareism? This question came from Fidel's in class, if you remember. Then we, we delved into it. And then moral agency and moral patience. I've said all that when I presented to you. That was what the person wanted. So by the time you do your discussion of whether or by the time you give your critical response as to whether non-human animals have basic moral rights. By the time you finish, you should have touched on direct and indirect welfareism. You should have touched on speciesism, and you should have touched on moral agency and moral patience. If you don't do all, you won't get a mark. It's 15 marks, because you imagine. You're set off, you set off immediately and, and take a position. Authors like so and so and so have argued that animals have, I mean, non-human, animals have moral rights. Others disagree. I'm inclined to side with so and so folks because blah, 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 blah. Yet, I think that their welfare gets get away from it. Their welfare is indirectly arrived at because we, we feed on animals, for example, we use them for clothing, medicine, what have you. So, Pursuing their welfare will ultimately lead to the welfare of the human person, even though blah, blah, blah. So you are, they are part of welfare. Is it? That is why it might not be too helpful. That is if you took the position I'm taking to argue to show you. Someone may take the op opposite, okay? Even though it might not be helpful to be a species in that regard, I think that you are also because sometimes a human being must die or must, must go hungry or must sacrifice their pleasure for the sake of the welfare of their fish and whatever in that sea. Why would you go and catch a, a fish, a live fish from the sea for your own pleasure and come and put it in an aquarium? You if they take you from your mother and your father and put you in a, a certain thing for people to look at and be happy, would you like it? Somebody's father is in the zoo eating. They go and stand there watching them that you want to enjoy the pleasure of eating them. Would you like it if, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, you are pulling and people come and they are watching how you pull and how you pull your fish. For the monkeys we are watching. <laughs> so, well, but if it is so, they have really, well, that's a challenge. Go even the land, the earth is somebody's mother. So now, will you walk in the air? Well, the air is somebody's father. We, we, will, we will survive. So, if you look at it that way, then, of course, this question is not on the entire nature, it's just on, on human animals because they are sentient, they breathe, they feel, they suffer, and so on. So that it takes the discussion somewhere. Then there is a moral agency and moral patience. Now, question six said, does the problem of evil negate the existence of God? I've discussed that also. Justify your answer and clearly show the implications of your response for science and morality in contemporary times. If you say it does negate it, you will have to answer how science and religion uh, cooperate to respond to. The unanswered question. Science is never able to tell us certain fundamentals. It's not able to. It pretends to it that it's not. You say we should go and do a the COVID-19 thing. We are going to do it. They say booster, they will boost, they boost, they will boost. We have been boosting that we will boost and boost. What is causing that is simple mosquito? We can deal with it. Eh? And the, the unanswered question is the world is created. And we are trying to investigate the regularities and the laws guiding it. We will do it from here to other. If you see everything came from a boom, what caused the boom? And so on and so forth. Maybe someone will say, we shouldn't be asking for what caused it. It won't matter. So that is the, the, the question in the morality in contemporary. The last one says, discuss and critically evaluate any one of the following theories of the brain. Any one. So you discuss it and then you critically judge it. 
ecofeminism is there, deep ecology is there, but anthropocentrism is there. And I think that on that note, I did more than I came to do. Any questions? All right. Please don't send me any question after this one. If you have questions, you should ask me now. I don't want to put it down. Not that you shouldn't ask me a question, ask me, but I don't want you to ask me things that you should have asked in the class. Like, Doc, so the exams. How many questions will we answer? Doc, please, so who is answer booklet? Those kind of things. Respectfully, don't ask me that. This is the time to ask that so that I can focus on other classes that I have from here. Unless it wasn't the answer. Doc, please, what about assignment? This. So the exam will be how many maximum? Don't ask me those. <laughs> we have dealt with all here. I take the silence to mean that people are okay. You just know that they have people feeling one or two gaps if they have to, or they are ready, bring it on. So that also bring it on. But I think that we are generally okay. So I want to end. Priscilla, do I have your permission as the class rep to end the class? Priscilla, are you there? Hey. Priscilla, are you there? Oh, she's not there. Who is here? Who can hear me? I want to end. Unless there's a question. Hey, Adam. Adam is here. <laughs> Adam. Yo, Adam, can we end the class? Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Yo, feed out. Uh, all right. I see all of you. I see Melky. I see Rose. I see Isaac. Ayaga. Thank you. Amanda Samoa. Powerful. Okay. Hey, we are, we are, we are here. We can. Hey, oh, oh, honorable, honorable. Hey, where is Ernest? Ernest is here. Hey. Oh, excellent. No. Then I think that we can. Yes, sir. No. Then I think that we can. Yes, sir. Someone was calling me. That if if there are no questions, then I think that we did we did well with ourselves. Doc, I was oh. wishing you a uh, happy new year. Oh, that's a do-do. Many happy returns. Hey, if he wishes you happy new year, then the rest of the year, I mean, you don't have any issue again. Because no matter what happens on the pink sheet, you have won the election. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Welcome, I wish you man. well. I think that we had a good time together and your exam should be verified. All the outstanding results that have to be released, I just want to mop up well so that when I release, then I don't have too many back and forth. So we we'll work on them, but focus now on your exams and do well. You will do fine, okay? All the best and take care. Thank you. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. We love you. Bye. I love you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.